Good morning, Professor Tucker. Thank you for coming online to our program and uh, agreeing on doing this uh, interview with us. I hope you're doing all right, holding up in the crisis and everything. Everything fine on your end? Yeah, it's fine. It's my pleasure to talk to you. Same here, likewise. So let me introduce uh, you to our audience real quick in uh, giving a a few uh, bits of background information on your on your uh, career and your training. You hold a Bonner Lowry Professorship of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia, and you're currently Director of University of Virginia's Division of Perceptual Studies, DOPS, where you continue the late Dr. Stevenson's legacy, who has been documenting on and studying accounts of children reporting past life memories for the past 40 years. Your own educational and, and career background is comprised of graduating from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, with a BA in psychology and in 1982, as well as completing a medical degree four years later. In addition to that, you received training in general psychiatry and child psychiatry, and you have been serving as the medical director of the Child and Family Psychiatry Clinic for nine years. Prior to that, you had successfully established your own private practice in pediatric psychiatry in Charlottesville, North Hello. Carolina. Sorry, Charlottesville, Virginia, not Charlottesville, North Carolina. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, Virginia, of course, you're right. Next to your practical work, you published numerous articles in scientific journals and have given talks to both scientific as well as general audiences. You're the author of Life Before Life, which is a scientific investigation of children's memories of previous lives, appeared in 2005, and your second book, Return to Life, is commented on by Dr. Wallace, who is a holds a PhD and is president of the Santa Barbara Institute for Consciousness Studies by saying, Jim Tucker's book, Return to Life, comes as a resounding wake-up call regarding human existence. For decades, materialists have insisted that consciousness is nothing more than a function or emergent property of the brain. But the fact is that scientifically, the origins and nature of consciousness and its role in nature remain a mystery. Professor Tucker, following this statement and the results of your own research, is consciousness indeed resulting from neural activity, electricity, and the action of neurotransmitters uh, at large, that is to say a mere byproduct of biological evolution, or was there more to it? How would you define human consciousness? Well, I would say that there's more to it, that, that consciousness appears to be more of a fundamental uh, aspect of reality, um, really separate from the physical brain and physical reality. I mean, obviously, there's a connection there. It seems that the consciousness is really more primary and, and the physical more secondary. And our cases with children or with memories of previous lives uh, support that because they show that, they appear to show, that the consciousness from one life has continued on even after the physical brain has died. Well, wow, that's interesting. I mean, that is probably a radical um, detour from what mainstream signs have been teaching us for decades, if not hundreds of years. And uh, it ideally leads me, it very well leads me to my next question, which is if consciousness is primary, as you just said, and uh, the biological is secondary, and other researchers are go, go as far as saying that uh, consciousness can be known, uh, non-local at all, I mean, not bound to any matter, as it were, um, like, People with near-death experiences report the same thing. And, and Pim Van Lommel, I'm not sure whether you heard of him. He's a cardiologist. He, he, uh, he has a book on the subject. He says that uh, consciousness may appear to be non-local. If all these um, claims hold up and um, consciousness is more than biology, how would you say where can a person's personality found? How does it come about? Does it presuppose a functioning biological brain and a body, or are the two totally uh, independent from each other? What's your take on that? Well, I think the idea would be there may be sort of a larger consciousness, a larger self that then inhabits a physical brain and inhabits a, a experiences of a lifetime, but that it's not constrained by that lifetime, that it, it um, comes before and, and exist after. Uh, so the, the experience that we have during a life is uh, perhaps only one experience that, uh, that's part of this larger consciousness. 
Other people say it's an illusion. The self is an illusion. We're just dreaming it. Experience may actually be a, a, a series of discrete events, as Professor Hammer says with his uh, org or him and Sir Roger Penrose. And he describes consciousness as a series of discrete events and likens it to, likens it to, a, um, to a movie with uh, 25 frames per second or our recording right now. You know, there is a certain amount of frames per second. And then in our perception, we compose these discrete events to make a consistent movie. Could the same be true for consciousness? What do you think? Well, yeah, it starts getting tricky even how you define the terms I mean, what you mean by personality or consciousness. And I, I do think that reality is probably made up of sort of measurements and observations as opposed to waves and particles. So the fundamental um, building blocks of, of reality, I, I do think, uh, come from um, from experiences, basically. Um, now, with personality, I mean, again, that, that can be used to mean different things, but the, the personality that each of us has, uh, we know is affected by things like genetics and certainly things like uh, environmental events that happen before life. The question is, is there also something that, are we a complete blank slate as we come in, or is there this uh, larger uh, personality or a larger mind that uh, also affects how we are in this life. And, and again, I, I think our cases uh, argue stronger that, uh, strongly that there is this aspect of, of mind that uh, predates the personality I have now. And um, perhaps the, the personality is just a, an expression uh, or one manifestation of a sort of the larger mind. Uh, and I think that's true with looking at the big picture, uh, with sort of reality itself, that the, um, the reality that each of us experiences uh, may just be um, sort of a manifestation, at least in large part, from the larger mind or the larger consciousness. It's interesting that you uh, use the, the term large consciousness. There's another theory I've been looking at which proposes that all of what we are experiencing here is maybe sort of a virtual reality. But again, you place experience and, uh, and the larger mind, as you call it, first. You say we may be all part of a larger mind, which predates our uh, incarnation here, which exists maybe indefinitely, maybe eternally uh, somewhere else and is not bound to locality. Um, it appears to me as if you were talking about the concept of a soul. Are you referencing that? Was that any Yeah, I mean, idea? soul isn't a term that I tend to use because it has religious connotations, um, okay. which are not necessarily part of this. But, but yes, you're talking about a, sort of a larger surviving entity. Which is a concept that, and you mentioned it yourself right now, that um, religions have been teaching for hundreds and thousands of years. There seems to be this idea in our species that something predates our incarnation and something may go on after it. And, uh, and all of that ties into, into these, um, well, largely considered spiritual phenomena. We're, we're not getting all spiritual here. We're trying to stay with science, uh, uh, you know, just to put it easier. Uh, and, and you said your cases uh, earlier, you said your cases seem to document that. Can you speak about and elaborate on some of those cases that you found that may show our audience uh, and tell them exactly what, what you found and why you think that there is something larger at work here? Yeah, so with these cases, so they involve typically very young children who spontaneously start reporting memories of a past life. And um, in the strongest cases, they describe a past life in some distant place and give enough details where people then go to that place and see that, in fact, there was somebody who lived and died whose life fits the statements. Um, so those get very hard to dismiss. I mean, with give you an example, a little boy named Ryan Hammonds um, from the United States, from Oklahoma in the Southwest U.S., uh, who at age four, which is fairly common, three or four, uh, started talking basically on an everyday basis uh, about a past life he said he'd had in Hollywood. 
and he would cry and, and beg his mother to take him back to Hollywood because he, he missed that life so much. Eventually, she got some books to, to, about Hollywood to kind of help him process this. And he saw a picture from an old movie, a uh, movie from 1932, and he pointed at one of the men in the picture and said that's who he had been in his past life. The man he pointed to was not identifying the book. In fact, he had no lines in the movie. Um, so Ryan's mom wrote to me to see if I could help sort out who this fellow was. Um, so we can be completely confident that Ryan had not somehow learned about this guy through any sort of ordinary means. Well, so I met and I went and met Ryan and, and his family. And um, then as we're trying to search for this guy, uh, Ryan's mom was emailing me um, very frequently with all of these statements that Ryan was making about his past life, which um, <laughs> uh, frankly seemed fairly extraordinary for uh, this guy with no lines in the movie. Um, eventually, we were able to, with the help of a Hollywood archivist, able to identify him. That the archivist went to the library of the uh, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences got all the materials about the movie that this, it's called Night After Night, this uh, movie that the picture was from. And most of it was about the stars in the movie, but she found one picture with this guy in it, and he was identified as a guy named Marty Martin. So we could then compare Ryan's statements to Marty Martin's life, and, and what we found was um, that there was kind of an eerie match. So again, Ryan sees this picture of this guy in a movie with no lines, unidentified, but he says how he had danced on stage in New York, and Marty Martin had danced on Broadway. Ryan said he then went to Hollywood where he worked in movies, which Marty Martin did, uh, mostly working on uh, dance in the movies. Uh, Ryan said then he uh, worked for an agency, worked at an agency where people changed their names. Marty Martin started a successful talent agency. Um, uh, Ryan said how his uh, he had a big house with a swimming pool and that the street address of it had the word rock or mount in it. Marty Martin had a large house with a swimming pool on Roxbury Drive. Um, and he even, Ryan said how he had died when he was 62. Well, Marty Martin, uh, he died in 1964. He died a long time ago. And uh, his death certificate said he was only 59. But then I looked into it some more. I talked with his daughter and his stepson, uh, and then I got records, uh, multiple census records and um, passenger lists, various things that all showed that in fact, Marty Martin was 62 when he died and not 59. So even though the death certificate said it was 59, Ryan was correct when he said he was 62. Altogether, we confirmed over 50 uh, of Ryan's statements match with Marty Martin's life. So that's the kind of case that we study and, and the kind of case that we think is meaningful and, and needs to be considered. This is some pretty strong, this is some pretty strong evidence uh, you just said. I mean, even though the death certificate was wrong and had the wrong number and uh, Ryan knew about it and, and, and said it accurately. Um, still, the, skept the skeptics might say, okay, there are some, there's some overlap, there are some numbers and, and, and data that matches. Um, he could have made it up. It, it could have, you know, children are susceptible. He could have heard about this somewhere and then he reported it back and made it look as if it were a matter of fact. Uh, what, what do you say how, to them? How do you address that? Well, there are a couple of, uh, issues there. So one, could he have just heard about it? Well, no. Uh, and when I went looking for Marty Martin initially um, uh, on the internet, there's nothing about him. There's more now, but, but, but caught, it came out after this case, then, then people looked into him more. Uh, the idea, could it be coincidence? Well, of course, 55 statements is a lot of coincidence, but in addition, I mean, we've studied 2,500 cases now, they don't all have the amount of verification that Ryan's uh, does, but there are a lot of them there uh, with significant details, personal names or names of places. Um, and, and I don't think coincidence is, is a uh, plausible explanation for, for the strongest cases. I hear you certainly loud and clear. And, and I mean, I'm 
partial and, and open to the concept, although I shouldn't be, you know, from journalistic position here. But um, I was, I had to make this point. I hope you understand, you know, that there's, yeah, of course. there's some, yeah. Oh. yeah. Well, okay. There's uh, memories. There is specific data that these children report. Why children in the first place? Did they have a lot more imagination, or are they? What is their personality make? Does it any in any way differ from other children? Well, we study children because they're the ones that have these memories. And it, um, for most of them, it seems as if they sort of come into this life with them. And then when they get old enough to talk, they, they start describing these things. Uh, we have done psychological testing with them and they don't appear to be dissociating or psychotic or anything like that. They don't seem to have a psychological disturbance. Uh, the one thing that comes out of the testing is they tend to be very intelligent uh, and very verbal. And it's possible that there are other children who have at least some memories when they're really young, but not being able to verbalize them, uh, the memories kind of fade. Whereas with, with these kids, they, they can talk about them and they get more uh, crystallized in their minds. And, and then so they keep coming out with, with more statements. So we don't really know if these cases mean that everybody has had past lives or if it's just these kids that, that have the memories. But again, it's, it's hard to know because the kids have to be able to verbalize these things at an early age or they can fade. I understand. Um, you said that they are verbal, they're intelligent. Those are some main as, uh, aspects and characteristics that you found. Again, why children and why don't more people report past lives is because culture at large is not open to the concept as opposed to the Far East where Dr. Uh, Ian Stevenson started his work. And I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you're following his tradition at large, uh, specify, I mean, focusing more on American cases, whereas his um, body of data was largely in the Far East, uh, Far Eastern countries. And again, uh, in the culture there, it's more prevalent not so much here. Could this be one of the reasons why not more children speak about those memories that they tend to have in younger childhood and please uh, fill me in on why that fades over time? Yeah, well, certainly Ian did uh, focus on places where he could find cases. And, and back when he started in the 1960s, uh, certainly people in the U.S. not tend to talk about these things, whereas they would in Asia. Um, but even there, Typically, the children stop talking about these things by the age of six or seven and, and then just kind of go on with their lives. Um, now, some of that may be, I mean, even there, uh, where there's a belief in reincarnation, it's still kind of weird for a child to be talking about a past life. And it may be as kids start entering school uh, that they don't want that kind of attention on them. But also, um, all of us lose our memories of early childhood around that age. So, uh, for instance, you know, a two or three year old uh, may know, a, say, a grandparent uh, is clearly in long term memory. But if that grandparent dies, by the time the child is six or seven, typically they will have no memory of them. Um, so, it kind of makes sense that as our memories of early childhood fade, then the memories of past lives would fade also. Um, now, they seem to keep going more if people talk about the cases more, if the children meet the previous family, they have relationships. Um, but again, that's the same with early childhood memories, where if, if there's a continuation where people are talking about things or people are seeing, the children are seeing people, then, then the memories stay long. Okay, that was new to me. You said that uh, everyone loses their memory, memory of early childhood around the age of roughly six and seven. And it's almost shocking to me to hear that. I mean, um, shocking because I thought that you could, like, um, for example, by employing methods like hypnosis or um, maybe even dreams that you can uh, access or have access to deeply buried um, memories from early in your own life as well. And maybe, uh, you know, there's past life regression therapy, which takes people back, you know, and, and uses hypnosis as a, as a means of gathering data. Is that something you find to be a serious uh, scientific method? Have you employed it at all? And if so, does it yield um, corroborable, uh, dependable results and data? 
Well, not dependable, no. So, I mean, when people use hypnosis to uh, try to retrieve memories, um, the issue is that hypnosis is not a reliable tool. So there are times where people can use it and, and recall amazing details like license plates at crime scenes or whatever. But there are other times where the mind just fills in blanks. And it's very hard to tell afterwards for somebody to know, is that an actual memory? So with early childhood stuff, um, what you find that with hypnosis, people do recall more details, but they aren't necessarily accurate. Um, and then with past life stuff, it gets even more unverifiable, typically. So uh, we're rather skeptical. We're quite skeptical, actually, of, of um, past life hypnotic regression. Uh, there have been a few very impressive cases, but most of them seem to be, uh, they may be valuable therapeutically, but they seem to be a creation. of them. Which again plays into the uh, rule book of the skeptics saying that these things are imaginary in nature and uh, they don't uh, yield any um, re reliable results. That, But you have gone beyond that. You actually checked the facts and you went there and you tested those statements, those claims made by the children. And they all checked out, as, as you told me, and, and, and the same for uh, Dr. Eden, uh, Ian Stevenson. And you said you had uh, 2,500 cases so far in your work, which spans now more than five decades, you know, uh, comprising of the work of uh, Dr. Stevenson and your own work. And now we have 50 years of looking at those uh, uh, accounts uh, in, in, in children. And uh, so I think even the skeptics might need to consider that as a pretty reliable basis of data. So we're not we're not uh, refuting anymore in this interview <laughs> that the data is there, the sources are there. You you've done the utmost possible to, to cross check and you know on the facts reported. However, let me let me reiterate once more really briefly. Um, um, mental disorders as well as um, as those memories. You said we lose them, uh, just so that our, and me and our audience understand correctly. We lose our memories of early childhood after, say, age six and seven, and then whatever comes up later on is probably just a product of our imagination. Is that what you're saying? Well, if you're using hypnosis, sure. I mean, a lot of people have glimpses from before, say, the age five, but very little. Uh, and again, if it's something that gets talked about a lot or uh, people, you know, somebody you knew at age two, if you continue to have contact with them, I mean, then, then the memories tend to stay there longer. Um, but, you know, if people recall being born or whatever. They, it's not that the memories don't get encoded, but retrieving the memories uh, past early childhood becomes increasingly difficult. Um, and again, it's the same with our cases with the past life memories. There are uh, quite a few adults who say they have at least some memories still from the past life that they first had when they were young children. But sometimes those, it's not clear with the adults that they may be kind of adding on memories as they go too, with, um, just like people trying to recall early childhood. So again, we focus on young kids where they, they Clearly, they are having uh, the active memories. And then we try to verify, okay, are they really memories or are they fantasy? And, you know, like with the hypnosis cases, someone recalls a life in ancient Greece is completely unverifiable. If the skeptic says it's just their imagination, I can't argue with that. In our cases, however, it's not that they're unverifiable. In fact, the details are quite verifiable, and when they are verified, that they do match uh, somebody, a past life um, that somebody lived, then that requires another explanation. Is there a threshold? You said um, earlier on when we started this interview, you said um, you had like, I mean, the, a number of, of, uh, of facts that you cross-checked and they checked out, and, and what is the number? Is there a threshold? Is there like a list, a, a scale, or some kind of uh, protocol that you're employing as to saying, okay, this is something we can consider as verifiable, and it's, it's I think you called it resolved in, in one interview. What's the method here? Could you elaborate on that a little? Well, I mean, there's not a exact cutoff. Um, when we, Ian Stevenson used the term solved to mean that a previous person uh, has been identified 
is like matching health statements. But the, the strength of that connection or the, the strength of that match will vary from case to case. And, and we don't do kind of a thumbs up or thumbs down decision about a case. Uh, we just look at the strength in each of them and, and it does vary uh, from case to case. There are some where the children may not make a lot of statements, but the statements are so specific that they can only apply to one person who lived and died. Um, there are others where they come out with all kinds of details, uh, but, but there's not one, there's not a, a straight number that we go by. Uh, but we tend to look at verifiable statements of the past life. Can the child, could the child have accessed that information through some sort of ordinary means? And then there are also some cases where we've been able to do tests that and the children recognize people or places from the past and, and under controlled conditions. Uh, so you add all that up, and, and then, again, um, some cases are extremely impressive. Uh, others are interesting, uh, but not as impressive. But then you look at the whole body of work, you look at the group of the strongest cases, then uh, I think it becomes quite. You said some of the information was so specific, they couldn't have looked it up somewhere, you couldn't have heard it. Can you give us an example? Well, there's another case, a well-known American case, a little boy named James Leininger, um, who remembered, seemed to remember, being a uh, World War II pilot who was um, killed out of the Pacific. And he gave the name, uh, of the aircraft carrier that he said his plane had flew, uh, had flown off of, it was called uh, Natoma, and he um, said that he was going to Iwo Jima, and he said that he had a friend on the ship named Jack Larson. Well, there was only one pilot from that ship that was killed during the Iwo Jima operation, and um, on the day that he was killed, one of the other pilots that went on the mission with him was named Jack Larson. Uh, and James also described a lot of details about the final crash, about how the plane had gotten hit in the engine, crashed in the water, and quickly sank, and that's exactly what happened with the pilot's uh, fatal crash. So the, the details all matched up in a way that uh, I, I think is well beyond coincidence, to be sure. And, and it was a death from 60 years before. It seems impossible that uh, this little two-year-old somehow access that information. And I think in the research and the literature, uh, when I prepared for this interview, um, they clearly ruled out that he could have accessed this information even when they went to the museum and looked at the at the planes that he flew supposedly in, a pre in his previous life. He couldn't have had the name from reading about it because at the time they went to the museum, this particular type of plane was not there as a as a piece of the exhibition. It was not. It wasn't present. So he couldn't have known. There's no way. That's right. He said he had flown a Corsair. Um, so people thought it might have come from where he saw it at White Museum, but the museum didn't have a Corsair then. Uh, but to, to emphasize, I mean, the museum had nothing on this particular pilot. I mean, you know, he was just one of the thousands of uh, people that were, uh, or millions, whatever, the hundreds of thousands of people that were killed during World War II. Um, and, and you have a very specific memory of them. And I mentioned behaviors. He had terrible nightmares of this plane crash I mean, over and over again. Um, so that, that adds to the, the impression that there was definitely a carryover from that line. You kept mentioning uh, behavioral um, deviations, let's call it that, or I mean some, some specific behavior that's not, well, it's kind of striking and significant in a young child, which is like beyond the norm. He had uh, these night terrors and uh, other people report phobias and there's really no source for that in their in their current life and then when you look at the past life it all makes sense and matches matches up uh i want to go beyond that i mean behavioral things again the skeptics might say yeah well okay well he has night terrors so what you know <laughs> forgive me for for saying it that way um but but there are cases in your own work as well as dr stevenson's that are pretty i mean almost eerie they had birthmarks that correspond correspond to uh, uh the cause of death in their previous life can you elaborate on this for a minute? Was this actually something that you uh, could verify beyond a doubt that they reported an accurate fact? Yeah, so that then takes the, the evidence beyond just memories and into physical, tangible evidence. So yeah, that uh, Ian Stevenson in particular was fascinated by these cases. He, he had a long interest 
in psychosomatic medicine, the, the connection between mind and body, before you ever got involved with this work. And here it looks like it, it's a mind from a past life that's affected the body. So yes, kids born with birth marks or even full birth defects that match wounds, usually the fatal wounds on the body of the previous person. And um, uh, Ian wrote a collection of over 200 of these cases. It, it's a uh, volume set is 2,000 pages long. Um, but he reviewed over 200 of these cases. For the birthmark cases, they're often unusual birthmarks, they either size or shape, or they're, they're puckered, or, or they look unusual. Um, and then for some of the de uh, defects, are quite profound, I mean, missing limbs and, and that sort of thing. Um, what he tried to do, when possible, of course, was to get the autopsy report of the previous person and, and verify the match. Uh, in a lot of these cases in Asian villages, that wasn't possible. But then he would interview people who had seen the body and, and determine what the injuries were to see how well they matched with the child's birth um, He listed 18 cases where the kids were born of two, bar, uh, two birthmarks, ones that matched both the entrance wound and the exit wound on a uh, gunshot victim. Um, and, you know, it all adds up to... Again, quite an impressive body of evidence that, that Ian really devoted years to. Um, we have also had some American cases with these. I mean, they, uh, they aren't common in the grand scheme of things. That, that having some memories is certainly more common than also having a birth defect. Um, but, but we do see them still. You said uh, that Dr. Stevenson tried to get the autopsy reports in order to verify whether these, again, these statements were real. And, uh, and you said uh, it goes beyond that. Some uh, children were missing limbs and I mean, uh, certainly, and, and these again corresponded with their own reported cause of death in a previous life. But that is interesting. I mean, this is, um, how would you, as a, as a scientist also, you have a medical degree, uh, how can the body, and we know about DNA, you know, and, and you, you inherit your uh, genetic make from your predecessors, from your biological family. All of this seems to be in contradiction with what we know about DNA and genetics in the first place. Because if you inherit the genome from your bio family and you have a birthmark that doesn't occur anywhere, there is no information for that. It comes from somewhere else. Where is this piece of information obtained from? What can the facilitating physical or genetic process be that they are born with these defects. Do you have an idea on that as to how that manifests? Yeah, I would just say a, a lot of birthmarks and, and even some birth defects are not necessarily uh, related to genetics. Uh, and the, the cause of them often isn't even known. Uh, but the idea would be, you know, I mentioned psychosomatics a minute ago. Um, the idea is that the mind can affect the body, and, and we know that it can in a variety of ways, uh, including sometimes very specific effects. So there, there are, are, I mentioned hypnosis, and of course I was negative about it as far as accessing memories. But there are certainly cases of, of where susceptible individuals are hypnotized, told that they're touched, say, with a hot object, and they'll develop a burn on the skin, even though there's nothing physically that would have caused the Burn. Instantaneously, it's yeah. suggested to the subconscious. They instantly manifest this on their body. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how. Uh, I'd have to look at exactly how quickly the burn manifests. I mean, not that it's literally a second, but I mean, it, it develops. Um, so it shows the power of the mind to have an effect on the body. So the rationale would be in these cases that uh, when someone is killed violently and traumatically, those traumatic memories. Uh, are a part of their consciousness. If that consciousness then carries on and, and inhabits a developing fetus, then it would then, um, uh, just like with the hypnotic cases, produce an effect on the body. Although uh, with it being a developing fetus, it would be then a, a permanent effect uh, rather than just say a temporary burn like you get with the I hear you. So um, the rationale seems to be that mind really informs matter, even down to the physical, down to the genetic code of, of, of a being. Am I summarizing it correctly? Would you agree? Well, not, it wouldn't have to be the genetic code. Um, and then it might be epigenetic effect where it affects what genes are turned on or off. Um, 
but it certainly, I mean, it, it's, it's no, um, it's completely mainstream to know that the, the mind does affect the body. Uh, you know, when we get nervous, our heart starts beating more. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of things. There's big connections between uh, the brain and the body, but that's just completely mainstream medical stuff. Uh, the idea is how far can you take that? And, and if there is an aspect of mind that is carried over, uh, from another life, how, how that may affect the body. Yeah. Um, again, this this begs the question: Where is this information stored? If it's not in our brains and our bodies, there is a large consciousness at, at play here, and it's supposedly not, you know, required to be bound to matter or anything physical. What is it? What is the nature of this? Well, it would, yeah, it would be something I think separate from our space-time reality. You know, that there is this uh, larger consciousness um, world uh, that that is different, and, and it, there's this intersection uh, where you know when you have a lifetime, the your mind uh, experiences this space-time world. Um, but it may then continue on in, in a different kind of reality uh, once once you die and, and no longer uh, in the history. Yeah, this this again co uh, aligns with uh, reports from people who have had near death experiences that say that they have access all of a sudden to a larger reality. They come back often with with new traits, new uh, skills that they couldn't have acquired during their lifetime. Some uh, experience spontaneous healing from terminal cancer, things like that of that nature. Um, so it seems to be. I mean, at least let's say there is plenty of suggestive evidence for this larger reality to be a fact a factual thing for for all of us where we come from however we're still trying um to access the nature of 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 consciousness at large that we're all we're all experiencing here in our lifetime in our bodies and uh it seems at least to an extent that quantum physics may offer some explanations there Again, I don't want to take you out of your field, but uh, it, it kind of plays into the discussion here. Um, do you think that that quantum physics might actually have clues as to what this conscious, what the nature of consciousness is, individual as well as uh, super individual? And uh, if so, in what way? Uh, earlier on, I mentioned like a, a series of discrete events, like Hameroff and Penrose called it. They have this uh, theory, theory of orchestrated objective reduction, which have us um, uh, experience the collapse of the wave function and then we as an incarnated being experience that as a conscious event. And you said earlier in our interview that uh, environment and personal experience seem to play a vital role. How do you tie all this, all these loose ends up to, to make sense for yourself? How would you put that in, in, a, um, in a picture, in a big picture? Well, first, quantum physics is an area that uh, basically, no one understands completely, and there are a lot of uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics that that you know people say there's many interpretations as there are quantum physicists. So um, you know we don't have all the answers, but I, I think one area of interpretation is that, uh, as you mentioned, collapse of the wave function. That observation collapses the wave function. That the role of consciousness in creating um, actual events is, is critical. Um, and it seems to be not just for you run an experiment and, and you look at the thing, but even for the past, that, that until, the, until things are observed or known, uh, even in the past, they essentially have various potentials that they only become manifest when they enter into consciousness. Um, which to me, looking at the bigger picture, the message is that the physical reality is not primary, that really mind or consciousness is primary. And, and therefore, there's no reason to think that, um, that with an individual consciousness that it ends when the physical brain dies because again, the consciousness is ultimately what's fundamental. Uh, coming back to the to the physical level once more, uh, Hameroff um, places um, the, the actual uh, 
well, place of, of uh, quantum states to go on in the so-called market tubuli in the body. And those are, there's a larger portion of them in the brain, but not exclusively in the brain. They're in all cellular tissue in the body throughout, and you have a medical, medical degree yourself, so you might be able to corroborate that or say, yeah, well, he has a point there, yes or no. Um, so, so we have, we have infrastructure, biological infrastructure, let me call it that, uh, which, which enables quantum states and as such, um, systems of information that may persist at least to a certain, you know, for a certain amount of time and even beyond, uh, the physical, the demise of the physical body as, as Hammer purports. Are you kind of partial to that idea? Would you say that is something that you could place your own results of your research, uh, in line with that? Well, I, you know, I don't know specifically the, the idea of the microtubules. I, to my mind, um, is not what is most important to me. I mean, I, I think getting down to that sort of mechanistic level, uh, to me, is not as interesting as, as sort of the larger picture. I learn about consciousness and, and how it's, uh, its place in reality. I have to mention it at least um, in my uh, preparing for this interview. Uh, I've come across here in, in your bio, it says you were raised Southern Baptist, which is one of the larger, um, let's say, um, Catholic um, uh, denominations in the, in the United States or, or based on Christianity, at least. Would you agree yeah, to that? Yeah, Protestant denomination. Yeah. yeah. Some of the concepts that we find in all major religions, the pre-existence of, of a soul, of, of a larger mind, it predates our incarnation. We come here, but we carry over a charge that we're to work, you know, off or remove the layers of that charge. Is that something you ever get conflicted with? Would you say my, my work shows differently? What would you take on that as far as a spiritual being? Well, I mean, I grew up going to Southern Baptist Church, but I, I'm not practicing. You know, I fall more into the category these days of spiritual but not religious. I think our work is certainly consistent with, uh, if you want to use the term spiritual, a spiritual understanding is that, again, there's more than just the physical world and, and physical beings, that there's this different part of us that you might call mind, but you can call spirit. So I, I think it's, it's certainly not an effort to disprove Christianity. But um, science and uh and religion or spirituality don't need to contradict each other or rule each other out. Uh, would you say uh, you agree on that? Is that something you can buy into? Uh, sure. I mean, the, the again, there are times where there will be conflicts. And, you know, I think um, if you want to get literal, the idea that, the you know, the world was created in seven days and all that, I mean, mind is, I mean, uh, science is pretty much refuted that. But, but in, in the bigger picture, there are often different realms and, and um, spiritual development or um, spiritual beliefs and faith and so forth are really in a separate realm from scientific. And kind of wrapping it up, um, what are you currently interested in in your research? Is there something you want to share with us uh, as to what you're working on, adopts, uh, what the future uh, vision of DOPS as, as a the Department of Perceptual Studies at the University of uh, Virginia, what your vision is there, how you're going to go on with your research. Do you want to share anything about that? Yeah, well, at DOPS, uh, we have different areas of research. So, of course, I, I cover the past life memory work. Uh, Bruce Grayson is the leading academic researcher uh, in the world for near-death experiences. Uh, but we also have a research lab that is uh, looking at a variety of things, and including what is going on in the brain while people are having psychic kinds of experiences. Uh, so we want to continue with all of this. In particular, with my own work, um, what I think is probably most key is to continue to study very strong American cases. I, I think, you know, I've mentioned a couple of them today, Ryan and, and James. Well, if we had 50 that strong that we could talk about, then, then I think it would really uh, become completely undeniable. Uh, so I'm focused on that as well. We continue to look at patterns in the cases and, and um, uh, to write up papers about various aspects of it. But, but I do want to continue to study strong cases. 
and and look at the intersection of the mind and the matter, the physical matter of the body, and and how they all interplay with each other. Is is that what you're saying? Well, certainly the the lab is doing that, and yeah, I mean, I, I continue sort of on a theoretical level to to try to look at the big picture, and is you may know, explore that some in in my second book. But yeah, the, the cases are the core, but then what messages we take from the cases and in front of the work, I think it's quite interesting as well. So thank you a lot, uh, Professor Chucker, for sharing time with us and taking time and let me ask you and poke your your expertise here here and there and probe it, I should say, not poke, probe it and um, have a nice rest of the day and maybe we can follow up on this sometime in the future if you're open to that and thanks a lot. Okay, yeah, take care. Bye-bye, thanks. Bye.